Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga show with I, your host Agostino Zinga and this is episode number 585, that's Cinco Ocho Cinco with me, your host Agostino Zinga, I hope you are doing well wherever, and I mean wherever this podcast may find you, I hope you are doing splendid. I'm doing pretty well, my friends. I'm doing pretty well. I'm full of caffeine. I'm full of water. I'm full of scrambled eggs. I'm full of green juice, which I'm just about to drink the second cup of. I'm also full of some water, which I'm sipping on. You can tell I've had a good morning. You can tell I'm going to have a good afternoon and I'm going to have a good evening and I'm going to head into the weekend pumped, juiced and ready to roll, especially after I finish my course of antibiotics, which finishes tonight, tonight. On the day of recording, which is Thursday, my antibiotics will finish. So I'll be ready to parte from Friday to Saturday onwards and continue living my everyday life. Because there's anything I hate more than um, people who try to stunt on me or try to big time me or try and think they're flipping cooler than me. If there's one thing I hate more than that, it's being ill. I absolutely hate being ill. I feel so useless. I get knocked out of my rhythm. I get knocked out of my schedule. Um, I can't do the things that I enjoy. I start to bemoan my luck. I start to get down in the dumps, which I never, I never, never usually am. All of these weird nonsense things that I try my best every day to push away from me, to not have latched onto me, to not be a normie, to not be a boring, um, drab, uh, pessimistic oaf. I try my best every day not to be that guy and whenever I get ill and I'm in bed and I've got no other option but to just rest and chill and try and get better, suddenly those thoughts come rushing back. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Especially the week of like not being able to do anything. That whole week, seven days or maybe eight days or whatever it was, where I couldn't move, I couldn't get out of bed, I couldn't record, I couldn't write, I couldn't take pictures, I couldn't go and mix and DJ, I couldn't go to the gym, I couldn't read, I couldn't watch cool documentaries, I couldn't watch cool movies, TV series, all these stuff that I enjoy to do on a daily basis I couldn't do and it absolutely broke my heart. Which is why I'm thankful, thankful that the illness I did have wasn't too serious. Because when she got to the hospital, because the thing that's really strange, I've mentioned before in another podcast, prior to being ill, no, no, prior to going to the hospital when you're sick, especially when I was really, really bad and I was literally struggling to swallow my own saliva, my tonsils were that inflamed and that full of pus and bacteria and all that nonsense that they were full of. Because I think I had, no, the doctor told me I had, um, I had a uh, Ginzy tonsillitis or something, right? It's a form of tonsillitis. Don't Google image it, it's flipping gnarly. So I had that and I couldn't swallow my own saliva. It was absolutely brutal. So my throat was all closed up and shit and I was in so much pain. And then I was like, I just need to get to the hospital just so I can have some sort of like pain relief. And I was like in there as well thinking, why don't they hurry up and see me? They're taking too long. But then the more you start waiting in the waiting area, especially in, a, in the emergency room, you start to see different people coming in. You start to see men, um, especially older men, older women, younger children, um, people just clearly going through it. Then you start to think, you know what? Maybe my shit isn't as bad as I think it is automatically. I think unless you're like a raging <clears throat> narcissist, it's very difficult to go to hospital and legitimately think that your pain is still more worth it and it's still more important than anyone else's pain. You don't think that. You automatically acquiesce. You automatically calm down a bit. You automatically um, just learn to just deal with the pain and just, you know, come to the resolution or come to the idea that most likely you're going to be okay. Just chill, relax, someone's going to see you, but you're going to be okay. But there's other people here who are clearly going through rougher times than you who clearly need help. Especially guys and women or guys and girls that I saw in there who are clearly suffering from some form of mental health issues. So on top of whatever they were suffering from internally, externally, whatever it may be, they were also not all there in their head. So imagine having to go through that, having to navigate through hospitals through that. The doctors that work there, the nurses, like the respect I have for those people is over the moon, especially when it comes to the NHS, mate. A quote unquote free service and they deal with people with the utmost amount of care attention to detail love compassion it's absolutely brilliant to see especially in the face of just pure disrespect because i know i couldn't do it people are coming up to you and asking you consistently when they're next being rude um being entitled being spoiled being bratty adults as well it's always more gross because uh, i worked in retail i've worked in bars before i've worked in um, hospitality i've done catering events and it's always gross whenever you are doing those kind of events and you're handing out flipping croutons whatever nonsense you're doing and it's just a really bratty entitled rude adult 
And you look at them and you're like, bloody hell, man, you have children, you know. You have children, you act this dumb, this uneducated, this um, unmannered and stuff. And you're like, what is wrong with you? I'm just doing my job. Yes, I might have fucked up. I might have put too many croutons on your plate or whatever. But just talk to me nicely and I'll correct the mistake. Don't order me around like I'm your manservant or slave or something. Or I'm, I'm some shit beneath your shoe. But people do that quite often. And I saw that a lot in hospital too. Hospital is even weirder because people are legitimately there for help. Do you know what I mean? They, they need the doctors and nurses more than the doctors and nurses need them. And they're being rude. It's like, bloody hell. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. It's like going to a restaurant and being rude to the waiters or the people that are making your food. Like, these guys are making your food in the kitchen that you can't see. Why are you going to rude to them is not probably the best um, strategy to go about things. But regardless, anyway, um, I am very thankful for my health. I'm very thankful that I didn't have a far worse condition. I'm very thankful that maybe some of the fitness and health stuff that I've been doing in the last few months gave me a little bit of a good base to recover. I don't know. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it. I'm just making up shit and I'm trying to sound like Joe Rogan. But I honestly do think that did do some level of help because when I did go back to the gym on the Monday, just gone, I did snap back into action. It didn't take me too long to kind of get back into the flow of things. So I think going to the gym consistently for like five times a week, especially for like the last few months or whatnot, five times a week as minimum has been real. Oh no, working out, sorry, five times a week because I go to gym usually three times a week then I run two times a day. I mean, two times a week, sorry, two times a day. I wish I could do that. Um, I think that definitely gave me a good base. So I'm thankful for it. I'm happy for it. And here I am, man. So cheers to some level of health cheers to being able to do what you love no matter how small or insignificant you may think it is because sometimes when you're down the dumps and you're in under your duvet over your duvet sweating with fever just absolutely sick to the head you sometimes don't know where the end's gonna come do you know what I mean so big up to that one ah anyway moving on so I've got a jam-packed weekend full of events. I thought I'd update you guys on because why not? It's my podcast and I want to talk about stuff that I'm into and love. First event I'm going to, which is kind of interesting, is going to Fold. Of course, where else am I going to go? Where else am I going to go? I flip, literally only go to Fold, especially in terms of like major nightclubs in the UK for the most part. The one I've visited the most, I think, might be... Yeah, oddly enough, the ones I've probably visited the most might be between Fold, Pickle Factory, and maybe like XOYO in terms of number of times over the years um or yeah maybe or maybe fabric as a, as a fourth option but regardless i'm gonna go to fold for a, a, a night called night service i'm ma majorly or majorly going for um to see a d dan and then of course to see law croft who i only stumbled upon the last few months or so because of the whole um ukraine thing that's been happening of course the war in ukraine i'm not too sure if she's actually from ukraine but i do remember her playing this set where she looks like she was crying and really emotional because she played a song that I guess she played one time when she played in Kiev. And obviously the techno scene over there is absolutely phenomenal. The clubbing scene there is phenomenal too. And I guess she has a big connection with that city or something along those kind of lines. And it brought back some really dark memories, I'm assuming, especially considering what's going on in Ukraine and her friends living there and whatnot. And she got a bit teary-eyed, but the song was fucking beautiful. So, um, I'm, I, and then I obviously listened to a few of her other sets and thought, okay, this girl's pretty decent. I'm going to check her out. So when I did see her name on the lineup, I was like, oh, wicked. Two birds, one stone. So I'm going to go see both of those two play. The other people I don't really know too tough on the lineup, but it's looking pretty good. So that's the first event I'm going to go to on the Friday. Now I'm thinking because I rarely have weekends off. Usually I'm working on the weekends or usually I'm doing this sort of stuff. So I kind of don't have time because I'm usually working in the day. Then in the evening I do the podcast or I go do a mix. So there's not really much time to go out and party. So this is the one time where I have some time free in the evenings to go out and party. So I'm going to make the most of it and try to hit up this fold event on a more of a gig vibe to try and see D Dan and see how he plays and stuff. Cause I'm really intrigued by his style of DJing. Um, I would call it somewhat mechanical, somewhat similar to like a DVS one. Um, it's like, it's, he's, he's one of those DJs where I enjoy because whenever you listen to a D-Dan set and then you Shazam the songs, they usually never sound the way he played them. So he either slows them down, pitches them up, um, cuts them up, uh, mixes them in a weird way that doesn't actually sound like how you're going to get it when you download it from Boomcat or you buy it on Hardwax or something. That's something that I really do appreciate. And just his style overall is amazing. Right? It's really smooth in terms of his transitions and whatnot. Sometimes you don't even, can't even tell that he's mixing three tracks in or two tracks in. It's absolutely phenomenal to see. So he's one of my favourites. And I think the last few times I've been to Berlin, actually, I've, I've been secretly hoping I'll be able to see him in his actual element playing. But unfortunately, that hasn't happened. So I have to see him in London. 
So that's going to be cool. I'm looking forward to seeing that. So that's on the Friday. And then the big event, which I'm really curious to see what that's going to be like, is Resistance um, number one, which is at Fold on a Saturday, which is essentially billed as their first residence only night, which is interesting because... I'm going to speak about my own experience with resident DJing coming up later on. But in general, from what I've understood with Fold, they had this other event called Unfold on the Sundays, which is usually their way of kind of showcasing their local friends and uh, community of people that hang around Fold and whatnot. And I'm guessing also because it's a free day in the calendar, it's a good way to kind of make some extra bucks to get some extra hype behind the name, the brand, um, to get customers to maybe fall in love with the place because that's a probably a pure representation of what they're about on Unfold as opposed to their regular nights because their nights are just, you know, rather promoters putting on parties and stuff for the most part. So that's a good idea of doing it. And if if I'm not mistaken, they actually they ask um what you call it they change the layout of the club too so they have the decks in the middle of the space so if you've been to fold you know it's a kind of like a rectangle square sort of space with the decks like facing the the back wall with like the side windows there but supposedly when they do unfold they usually have it in the middle I've never been to unfold actually considering I've been to all you know I went to the very first party um at fold I've been to loads of other events there but because I usually work on the weekends and because you know. I, I automatically think partying on Sundays if I'm not going on holidays is kind of jobless. I do try to avoid it. I try to kind of keep my going out quite regimented, a bit army-like. So it's like Friday and Saturday or Thursday and Saturday only. And then from the Sunday onwards, I'm kind of down... I'm kind of um, down-tempoing myself, sort of like you know, deregulating myself and kind of bring myself back to some sort of level of even keel, eating healthy, drinking loads of water so that when I get into the Monday, I can go straight back into working out. So I don't really like to party on a Sunday. And if I'm not mistaken, the Sunday unfold thing is usually from like 12 p.m. to like 12 a.m., which is a bit of a mad time to go to out on a Sunday. The last thing I want to do, especially if I'm nursing a hangover, is go out again on Sunday. But, you know, horses for courses. So I do like the fact that they've made what it feels like to be like the upgrade. So if they've got a residence only night for like up and coming people or people that's loose to associated with Fold, let's say for instance, then you would imagine this resistant night would be like an opportunity to get the people who are actually on the residence roster because they have residence um, DJs. Well, I think I featured last time I spoke about before and I said it was good, don't get me wrong to see them, but it was a little bit whitewashed. Do you know what I mean? It was a little bit one note in that regard and considering how um, rich and culturally rich and diverse Fold is as a club when you go there on nights out, like I've been there to see Christian AB which was a pretty much a tech housey type crowd I've been there to see Richie Horton I've been there to see Indivision type people I've been there to, to see um I've been there to, for like Raga Scar nights, not Raga Scar, um, drum and bass nights, sorry, um, and reggae nights, of course. Um, I've been there for like gallery events. So they've got a, def a, a real rich tapestry of people that go there. But the resident, if you look at the residence lineup, it doesn't actually reflect the people that actually go to a club too tough. You know what I mean, it's a little bit white. But again, it's the first time they're just going. It's a new club. You know, give them time. Hopefully, over a few months and years, whatever, things will progress and they'll maybe start to invite more people in who maybe, you know, cover the whole demographic people that go there. But regardless, if they then have this thing to be the main thing, like the upgrade, so you go to Fold to start, you know, to showcase your skills. If you're good enough, you might get signed on to be a residence. And if you're a resident, you then get to play on the Saturday event, which is sick. And I'm hoping, hoping to God that this, if this is successful, that other clubs are to do the same thing because if there's one thing that we're lacking um, a lot in London, I feel like we have some of the best clubs in the world. We have some of the best club nights I feel in the world. We have such some of the best variety of musical genres you can go and dance to in a nightclub in the world. Anything from like, I, the other day I saw someone put on an event, I think it was in the yard or something for like... Um, uh, 2000s indie sort of stuff, right? Like an indie sleeves type event was going on. I see people doing Drake and Beyonce nights here. I see people doing jungle events, drum and bass, um, UK funky still going, Afro beats, Afro house, um, grime. Like the genres are just nuts. You can go out every weekend and just go to a Pacific event that just plays music that you are into. So that's great. But one thing we don't have, which I don't like, is that we have too much dependency. I feel like, especially within the stuff that I'm into, what I go out to see in the kind of electronic music scene in terms of techno, house, disco and stuff, there's too much emphasis put on booking big names and there's not enough clubs who are doing resident only nights like XOYO, um corsica because I, I think might have one actually i'm not, if I'm not mistaken pickle factory oval um village underground i don't know whatever clubs i can name um whatever else right all these other clubs right i feel like they do owe a little bit to the culture of dance music in london to have residence nights because if anything if anything that is similar to London and Berlin is the abundance of DJs. 
I'm a DJ for fuck's sake, right? If I'm a DJ and you don't even know that, let alone the people who are much more successful than I am or bigger than I am, our DJs too, just imagine the amount that we have legitimately. There's so I would love to know the concentration of DJs that exist just in the Dalston postcode alone or in the Hackney postcode alone. It must be in the thousands, right? So many, so many people who are really good, really sick people that can play, um, I think, on the bigger stages. But unfortunately, they don't get the opportunity to do so unless they do the conventional thing and you know make a really big hit song. So it will be nice to see maybe other clubs see what Fold has done with resistance with this resistance right and be like you know what maybe we can copy and do our own thing too or we promote our own people like i don't know venue mu what's that thing called venue mot um in south they could do one um i don't know new, new power studios whatever right there's loads of these other clubs around i feel like that probably or unit 858 or whatever those kind of places like put on more residents only because i know they do give people a chance to put on parties so if you're a promoter and you want to put on your own party book your mates you can but it would be nice for them to put on just like a residents only night so you just go out and party and you know discover new artists because that's one thing that i think is really cool about going to places like berlin a lot um to going to see like how they do clubbing at like a really high level is that sometimes for instance if you go to like um let's say let's go let's use an example if you go to like sisyphus in berlin for the most part if you go there as just a tourist you probably won't have any idea who's playing you probably might go there because you saw an article in a daily mail or something you're gonna want to check it out but the thing is they have such a great residence lineup that you don't even know about that they usually kind of publicize on telegrams and stuff or sometimes they have it on inside that when you go in there, you won't realise or know that there's someone playing behind the decks who's like got 10, 20, 30 years of experience playing music and playing in front of a you know a captive audience for the best part of 10 plus years, whatever it may be, honing their craft, understanding how to read a room, um, understanding their own kind of you know musical vision and how they want to present themselves. And then by the time you go there, they are elite level. So they're, they're, they're kind of performing at a really elite level. It surprises you, you discover a new person, but that person's been playing for fucking ages. And again, since you first, you know, it allows that person to then be able to kind of rise, raise their profile and get to a point where maybe they can go and tour and, you know, kind of progress their career onwards and upwards that way. But when you kind of go too much on the... And then also it kind of gives the customer too a chance to kind of maybe take a... It, it gives opportunity for a customer to take a chance on someone or take a chance on a night, take a chance on a club space, whatever it may be, which we don't have enough of, I feel like. I feel like too much of our events are centered around tickets, are centered around pre-sale, all this sort of nonsense because they want to get people in guaranteed for a particular DJ to play, which obviously then goes back to the whole um, set list lineup thing, which I fucking hate which you know, predominantly, predominantly most clubs in London don't publish what times people are playing at all because they want to keep it hidden so that you can go there and spend money at the bar and not just go and see Harvey play for two hours and then leave. It's just a fucking frustrating situation. So I hope if this is successful and people go out and their droves in it and it does really well, then maybe other clubs will go in and, and copy it. So that's what I'm probably going to end up doing on a Saturday. So that's the thing that I'm looking forward to going forward. Then, in other news concerning DJing and concerning myself, because it's my podcast, why can't I talk about myself too? Me, 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 me. I have some good news. I finally got booked to play at a place that isn't, I would say, a pub. Well, it's a pub place, but, you know, it's more like a club pub place. Because most of the time I play in places, I usually play like bars and pubs, which I'm okay with, which is kind of the plan in general. I wanted to kind of pull away from the hipster, East Endy, um, South london -y kind of place that I was usually kind of playing in for the most part because I felt like it was oversaturated. And I obviously didn't have the opportunity to play more regularly and consistently like I wanted to. And I wanted to hone my craft and get to a point where I was playing all the time consistent i was playing consistently and i was also playing in front of a somewhat captive audience so i could hone my craft so i could get better and better at kind of reading the room and knowing how to play like one for me like two for me one for you that kind of sort all that sort of like stuff methodology behind djing and just maybe improve my overall taste in music and whatnot and it worked out pretty well i got opportunity before the pandemic to play for the most part every single week in the year bar only a couple of weeks here and there usually between the days of like thursday and sunday i'll be playing somewhere which is fucking amazing to do honestly i'm really grateful for the opportunity but then of course the pandemic struck and i at the time as well was a little bit self -conscious. i was a little bit i wouldn't say guilty but it felt a little bit like higher robbery sometimes you go to these places these pubs and they're paying you 100 quid and you're like i really shouldn't be getting paid this money because number one there's hardly anyone here number two if you had somebody that was pretty had good taste and was able to put together a decent playlist they could do is just about as good a job as i could do playing actual music behind the decks 
just put a good playlist together, kind of sequence it in a way that kind of, you know, tells a story or takes you through a journey from like the time you open to the time you close, have some party tunes in there to get people going, uh, you know, whatever, around 11, 12, whatever time it may be, your peak, and then continue. And then that's what effectively happened after the pandemic. After the pandemic, people stopped going out anyway in general. The amount of people that was going out kind of decreased. And I think pubs realised, hold on, if we just put together a good playlist or we just have NTS playing on the background, we don't need to have these fucking guys playing and that's essentially what happened and my sets completely dried up and then because i spent all that time away from the hipster cool places in s south and east i then wasn't in tune with that stuff do you know what i mean so i kind of put myself in a bit of a shit situation but it was all right because i always kind of viewed it as like a really cool hobby to have which i would obviously love to pursue as a career but it's something that i'm kind of in love with first as a fan first as a because as a consumer of like nightlife the business around it the the politics around it the design around around it the social the sociology part of it all of it i'm do you know what i mean i'm just intrigued by it in general so the fact that i get a chance to play anyway is a flipping good and it's something that i don't take for granted but it's legitimately funny the place that i'm playing because i'm playing at this party on saturday the 3rd of july in london um and i'm my set i'm the opening set of course because you know i'm no one so i'm playing from five to seven on the 3rd of July at a place called the Brixton Jam which I played at beforehand for like an open deck thing which I might have done a good job at which is why they maybe called me back but if you look at the flyer <laughs> I'm not sure if this is me getting booked based on my skills or me getting booked based on my skin colour what do you reckon or my race what do you reckon because the event's called Big Big uh, sorry the Big Disco Day and Night and um, the subtext is the illustrious blacks, which I'm assuming are people playing there, right? So I, think, I don't know, maybe it's two people playing, a group of people, I don't know, an act or whatever it may be. And then there's a, us listed on the DJ lineup, right? The people that are playing. And obviously I'm there, handsome black man. So I wonder if this is a night that's catered towards black people in disco. And they thought, you know what? This guy is black. He plays disco music. He's pretty do good. Let's, let's have him playing. Which I'm not really that bothered about, to be honest. The fact that I get to play regardless, I don't really care if it's for reparation reasons affirmative action whatever it may be get me on a lineup and i'll fucking destroy the dance floor of course but it's also cool as well because i get to play disco which i haven't played in ages out um for the most part when i have played out i played a lot of house i played a lot of techno um i've not really played disco for a long time which is why i used to do a lot in the bars and pubs and shit i'd be playing loads of cheesy stuff loads of really cool that's the thing about disco twist it's actually really cool you can play a lot of pop disco a lot of indie dance a lot of good remixes but because it's disco you can also in insert some really crazy edits and stuff that you found yourself from like again hard wax you found from juno and shit like some really cool tunes that you can play because it kind of feels jo jovial and happy and whatnot and um so that'll be pretty cool to see um going forward when i end up playing there so two hours of disco music from me on saturday the 3rd of july i'm really looking forward to it um it's going to be a great time um again playing out is something that i've always enjoyed i always call it one of the best hobbies in the world you know some guys love to play like golf and shit and they take it very seriously when they get into it because it's super engrossing it gets you really pumped to get better and whatnot to buy new equipment and to meet different people to play on different courses i think djing is the same thing once you if you've got a little bit of a passion for music and you love music and then you start to dj and you start to um be able to maybe like you know make people dance you start to be able to mix tunes together you start to maybe hone your craft develop your sound um whatever it may be it becomes incredibly addicting and usually the better you the better your taste in music is the more you start to realize how shit most people are at djing because for the most part, most people, I feel like, in general, because it's such a low barrier of entry, it does invite a lot of charlatans and most people aren't that good. So the kind of gap between like not good and very good is like very, very wide. But obviously, the other thing with it as well is that because it's such a low barrier of entry, it's one of the only things I think in the entertainment industry that most people can do if they dedicate themselves to it. You know I mean, if, if you really want to go and do it, you could essentially one day be in front of a crowd of a thousand people playing songs, you know what I mean, that you didn't make, um, which I think is way harder to do if you're like in a band or something, do you know what I mean? Like imagine that, or to, or to sing or to rap or some shit, that'd be fucking incredibly difficult. But DJing allows you to kind of circumnavigate that thing and, you know, probably be in places and situations that you probably have no right to be in, but, you know, the game is the game. So we're really looking forward to that. Saturday, 5th of July, I'll put a link of the flyer in the... Oh, actually, I'll put the flyer 
or whatever details up on in the descriptions once it gets available on the site and shit so you can click on it and add it to your favorites if you want to or if you went around blah blah who cares who cares who cares but yeah happy with it really really glad hopefully this is the start of many many other sets that are going forward with this i can only do my best as well when i get presented with those sets and try and absolutely smash it like i said previously i treat all these things really seriously i treat them as seriously if i was going to play berghain if i was going to play at palomas robert johnson's um print works whatever this is the same thing to me jeremy i take it very seriously so i'll be uh, you know mulling over my playlist on record box for weeks and weeks to come buying new songs and stuff and get myself prepped and ready to roll so that i can absolutely tear tear that place apart when i do end up playing at the bricks and jam so really looking forward to that um next on the list we have here yeah this is why we have you <laughs> courtesy of kind of music crew one of the many reasons, one of the many problems I have and issues I have with being a resident DJ or being somebody that's on that kind of level in terms of just playing locally, in terms of, you know, my um, overall uh, level of, not fame, level of notoriety, right? Or whatever it may be, is that for the most part, you get to play the shitty sets. You get to play the times that people would refer to as like the graveyard shifts, right? Or the sets that no one really wants to play. So usually you're playing really early, your opening, or your closing when usually sometimes people have left because the main guest that they went to see has kind of gone and they've probably run out of drugs. So then there you are playing to a crowd of people who like, you know, they're just, they're just moving side to side because you just happen to be there and you're playing music, but it could give a shit about you and they probably will never remember your name after that night anyway. And I think this meme from Kind of Music Crew kind of, you know, kind of um, represents every horror situation that most resident DJs are being in. And it says resident DJs when they're a guest and it's ridiculously, ridiculously, ridiculously true because for the most part, you don't get a chance to shine. So when the guest does come on, you want to maybe stand next to them and prove that you can also you know perform on that level too because for the most part like i said before even though the gap between being crap and being good at djing is really wide i still think there's such a thin line between most people that for the most part it's very difficult to say because this person's well known they're much better than the person that's unknown usually it's not the case especially if the person's really really well known because they then end up getting complacent they don't end up innovating they don't end up going to buy new tunes or being more curious or digging deep into their bag they just play the hits and keep it rolling um but if you see when you're a resident you're legitimately fighting for your life every single night right you don't know if the set you played at the club is going to be your last if it's going to be the first of many you're absolutely fighting for your life like you can't really make any mistakes so when you do see a a guest coming in it's no surprise that you are kind of eager to twiddle around with the knobs to move around things do this whatever maybe just so you can appear to be um on their kind of level somewhat but i think also as a kind of um as a punter as a punter i have to say i do think that i don't it would to say but i don't enjoy going to see djs play and then seeing so many people behind decks like the way this kind of music thing is set up trying to look cool and whatnot and also don't enjoy the abundance of people in the background. It really pisses me off. It's kind of like rap shows when the, all the hangers on and the friends of friends are on the stage trying to look like they're part of it too. It's like, nah, man, let the talent do the talent and you get off the stage. It's one thing I appreciate about most. Again, I keep mentioning it all the time, but yeah, please forgive it's my, it's my podcast. Let me do it. But what I appreciate all the time is when I go to Berlin, it's the same sort of thing is that they're very strict. Bergheim being a good example of it because they've banned many people. I think they chucked out fucking, um, what do you say? What's his face? Rishi Horton, I think, has a story about getting chucked out of Berghain because he tried to bring a friend behind a booth or something. Do you know what I mean? They don't play around that shit. Like, it's only the guest that's behind there, no one else, maybe a handler, if that. I think I've seen one person or maybe like a partner something times I've been playing. Or sometimes when I, sorry, when I see someone playing at Panorama Bar, I might have seen their partner in the booth or something. But for the most part, it's only the person playing. No one else, everyone else kind of stays from on the outside, which I love because I feel like it places... A focus on the DJ but also oddly enough over there they don't usually have setups that kind of put DJs up on pedestals usually in a corner of the back somewhere but they kind of encourage us to go and dance and have a good time which I think is awesome so I think sometimes with those people in the crowd behind and over there it's as a punter it's kind of distracting and kind of leads you just to kind of just look at them 
or to kind of be standing there with a bit of FOMO, feel like you should be there too. It just creates a weird atmosphere, personally. I, I, I just don't like it. I prefer just to have the person playing because imagine even this image of the meme. There's an amazing kind of skyline behind them. We can't see it because there's loads of hangers on behind them too. But that'd be pretty sick to see from behind. I mean, just them playing themselves all free as a crew and then completely empty at the back so you could actually see the environment they were in and whatnot. I don't know. That's just a little kind of moan on my side. It probably doesn't make any sense. But one thing I kind of notice a lot with these cult sort of things going forward. But hey, ho, what do I know? Next on the list here. We have an ish topic cursey, sorry, of Daily Mail featuring the one and only Jennifer Aniston, who I think most of you guys will be familiar from Friends. And she has some very choice words to say um, about the current state of culture, celebrity and fame and whatnot. And I don't necessarily think she said anything wrong, but for some reason, people online didn't really like it too tough. So I'm going to kind of go through this article and let you know what I think as well as we proceed. So this is the following. Jennifer Aniston is facing backlash following comments she made about the ways internet stars find fame in modern society. The, with angry fans accusing the star of trying to gatekeep the Hollywood elites. Which is weird, right? So fans are getting annoyed that a Hollywood elite is calling out the industry for only promoting people who don't really have any discernible talent and are just famous for the fact of being famous. Um, and now the fans are not only acting like gatekeepers, they're also telling the elite off for not being more cool and just being okay with a 17-year-old with a big tits for been taking money off her table. It, it makes sense why she'd be upset, do you know what I mean? It really continues. The friend star 53. Wow, she was fucking good for 53, innit? Uh, caused controversy with the comments she made during a certain interview with Pam and Tommy star Sebastian Stan, which she reflected on the way the likes of Paris Hilton and Monica Lewinsky fame has shaped by the rays of anti culture. In a segment of the Actors on Actors interview on Variety, the pair had been discussing the infamous Pam and Anderson and Tommy Lee sex, leak, sex tape leak in 1995, which Stan's Hulu series was based upon, leading Anderson to discuss internet culture at the time. Um, Anderson began to comment on how the leak took place at a period when the internet began to influence society as she stated it was right at the time when the internet really shaped a new culture about people becoming famous she said this thing of people becoming famous for basically doing nothing but yet having these incredible careers and then women's reputation I mean Paris and Monica Lewinsky and all those Lewinsky was devoted to Stan replied and said when you look back in the 90s you do see how many things were happening in the decade even OJ Simpson thing was actually the beginning of the 24 New York circle his comment led to a horrible boss's star to add I feel lucky that we, we, we still got a little taste of the industry before it became what it is today. More streaming services. You're famous from TikTok. You're famous from YouTube. You're famous from Instagram. It's almost like it's diluting the actor's job, which is a little bit rich from an actor to say that, to be honest. But I get I kind of get what they mean. I get and get what they mean. The funny thing about the comments that they're making is that I feel like it's actually on the actor more so than anything to just decide what kind of career they want to have and how they want to present themselves. I feel like I remember seeing an interview with actually Chris Brown actually recently where I think someone asked him the same sort of thing, like, why aren't you more, like, online, more social, and putting your life more out there? And I think he said something along the lines of, like, it's very purposeful. Like, he actually doesn't want to post what he eats and what car he's driving and where he's going because he wants a bit of mystery. He wants to, he, like, he kind of adores that kind of era of celebrity or musician when you didn't really know too much about them. You saw them pop out at some sort of industry event, but you didn't really know what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, what the inside of their mouth looked like and shit. I mean, you kind of, kind of kept it close to the chest which i kind of like and i feel like actors nowadays have to decide what they want to do but i think because the actor's profession is such a it's such it's so kind of uh skewed towards the actor being subservient to the industry because you have to be chosen someone has to decide to pick you and say hey we want you to play the role of the bold guy in this mob thing because there's 70 million other bold guys who can act, who can do that job. But for them to select you is a very big deal. So because of that, if you're an actor coming up, it'd be pretty dumb not to try to get yourself famous on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, whatever it may be, to increase your profile so that you can have more chance of maybe getting a movie role because you also know these production companies, these movie studios, um, because of how the economy is and just because of how much money it actually takes to make a movie, they would much rather also that you came in with a previous audience because that could also maybe give them opportunity to actually make money back on this show or this movie that they're making. So maybe you increasing your profile and becoming more famous will actually increase your chances of getting a job. But of course you do that and it does dilute 
or take away from what you do day to day as a job because people then will see you just as like a social media type person like similar to like um julia fox what she's kind of going through right she's kind of going through maybe this weird um phase in her career where she's maybe trying to figure out have fun or just kind of hone in what she's actually about but she came into the industry being a somewhat quasi scene girl an art hoe you might describe it in which evolved into a stone cold art a stone cold actor but now it's sort of like I don't know what is she now do you know what I mean so it's a bit difficult to kind of ascertain that and again I think you're taking away the focus from her movies as well because of all that nonsense and the extra stuff for outside of the acting stuff so I do think it's on the onus is on the actor more so and I don't think it's and I, and I honestly don't think also that PewDiePie and YouTube stars are really taking any food off these guys' plates. Like, let's be for real. If you're a fan of a YouTuber, you're a fan of them for, because you're a fan of them. It's not going to take away from your fandom of liking whatever name actor that you like. Do you know what I mean, it doesn't make any it doesn't make any sense in my regard, in that regard. But anyway, this is some of the comments people online. It says this. Jennifer Benenson plays the same character, which is just a version of herself in every movie, and it consistently gives nothing. The only um, that sa the only thing that saves her is that she's pretty. Um, is that she has a pretty okay co-star to save her as comic relief. Always nepotism babies with no talent wanted to give her the take. <laughs> wow. They're so mad they can't gatekeep the title celebrity so they stay with their weird nepotism in New Hollywood. Odd. Jennifer Anderson needs to calm down with her opinion when her nepotism got her into the industry and now she continues to make $200 million per year just off the syndication of a show. Now person says, I miss it when we could only get famous when we were already privileged and rich. That's not true. Do not Google Jennifer Anderson's parents. So the parents thing is interesting because it feels like nowadays if ever someone says something controversial about careers and jobs and shit the first thing people do is to discredit them is look on wikipedia to find out if their parents names are are, are like in blue are like italicized or italic or have a link to it because it usually means that there's some sort of public figure there's some sort of wealth some sort of fame but i don't think the fact that your parents are well known takes away from the idea that maybe when you were coming up you had to break your back to become an actor you become an actor and you become famous for it. Even if you do play one role per, you do play the same role in every movie, it doesn't matter. You're still getting paid for your talent of being a supremely gifted and very good actor who's also famous. So that's part of the package. Um, so it's no, it's no, it doesn't feel like a bad thing for that same person to look at it and say, if I can be famous as a package, why can't you be famous as a package? Why is your fame just a fame thing? Like you think of someone like a Madison Beer, for instance, like what is she actually famous for? Especially again, maybe some people say, Oh, she's Nickelodeon Disney girl, but if you just saw her nowadays going to Coachella and do whatever, but what does she actually do day to day that would make her famous? Or is she just famous for just being alive? Do you know what I mean? It just doesn't make any real sense. Like Hayley Bieber is the same sort of thing. All these people, they exist. But it's not a bad thing. I think if anything, the fact that we have this sort of spread now where you can be a traditional famous person from the industry, um, from a music label, from a movie, from a TV show, whatnot. You could also be very famous in your own niche from being a very hyper-focused content creator on YouTube who just focuses on making stuff. You know what I mean? And you're very famous within your little niche. Maybe people outside of it don't know, but people that are inside the industry or that know that scene, that know about woodmaking or whatever it may be, they know who you are, which is also a flipping sick thing. Um, because ultimately, these people all get to provide for their families and shit, which is fucking amazing to see, personally for me. Um, but yeah, big up Jennifer Aniston. Hopefully, you guys agree with that point. If you don't, let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Next on the list here, we have news courtesy of Annabelle Ross, who actually had a pretty decent um, article that I think I spoke about a few months ago, maybe a year ago, concerning Derek May and some of the heinous, absolutely disgusting allegations that were laced against him. And for the most part... Um, the article, if I'm not mistaken, had an immediate sort of effect, I feel like. Some festivals cancelled his bookings, some people kind of distanced themselves from him, but for the most part, it feels like most places just kind of try to play the waiting game, wait until the outrage sort of like simmered before they slowly started to rebook him back at places and stuff, which is really bizarre because if you read that RA article that has several accounts of people who kind of detail what happened to them, what occurred, it's really bad. Like, it's really, really, really bad. There's one thing which I think I've done before in the past where you maybe um, you're out and you're, you're out and about, you're trying to maybe, you know, hook up with somebody and you might read the signs wrong and what you thought was an invitation to say hi was actually them saying hi to somebody behind you <laughs> or something like that, right? And that's fucking embarrassing and awful and horrible, right? Or, you know, they go for the handshake, you go for the hug or something, like awkward, weird. But some of the stuff that was alleged with Derek, I think I remember... 
the one story of some lady or some girl going to his room to talk about music with a friend and being a big fan and then suddenly it turning into an essay or thing that was what was super disturbing because that was a fan an absolute doting person who legitimately thought the world of you who listened to all your tracks who's got your vinyls who's watched all your interviews who follows you on social media like a proper fan fan and then you put them through that it's like mate you are a different breed of a person but anyway it looks like Annabelle Ross has continued on her investigation uh, behind some of the stuff concerning Derek May and other things and it's titled On Derek May Detroit Techno and Toxic Male Solidarity which I'm going to read to you now so it says as follows. Carl Craig banned me from reviewing Movement Festival this year, held in Detroit nearly three weeks ago. I wasn't sure if I was going to public to go to, going to go public with this information, but after what happened this weekend, I felt I had to. How can you ban someone from a festival? Can't you just go anyway? Or, or do they have a picture up at the ticket gates and if she tries to come through, they're going to... Or And also, or maybe does it mean he told her that she can't do an official review for the festival? So just write it anyway and put it on your blog. Why can he stop you from writing stuff or going to places? It's such a bizarre thing to do. And also, what does Cochrane have to do with this? Anyway, this, anyway, let's continue. I was supposed to be writing about Moving Festival for Mixmag, but a few days ahead of the festival, I got a call from my editor. Moving had told him I could no longer review the festival. Oh my God. Craig had given the crew of festival an ultimatum. Him or me. If I was allowed to review the festival, he wouldn't perform. So Craig, Carl Craig, the founder of movement festival or whatever right it seems like here and one of the i guess the main billings over there from being a detroit legend is legitimately giving publications ultimatums because what they dare to write articles exposing that his friend might be a creep this is fucking insane it continues Craig had a headline slot on Saturday night on the Detroit Love Stage he hosted a festival that day and another slot on Sunday night playing back-to-back -back set with James Murphy the James Murphy from LC Sound System. Hmm. Craig has been intimately involved with Moving Festival since its inception back in 2000, when it was known as the Detroit Electronic Music Festival. He's one of the most celebrated figures in techno, techno, Detroit techno. Of course, Movement was going to choose Craig over me, especially when his ultimatum was delivered in an 11th hour, especially having lost another headliner in Nina Kravitz the days prior. So, you're telling me, in some weird parallel universe, again, the, you have to believe... It depends what you believe in terms of narrative, but let's let's just run with this one narrative. You're telling me that movement were more comfortable with booting Nina Kravitz off of their lineup because she happened to be a sympathizer for flipping Putin. However abhorrent you think it is, but she's from a she's you know in her lap of luxury, you know deciding to support Putin and the invasion of Ukraine without any skin in the game and shit. It's annoying. It's gross. It's disgusting. But again, she's from she's really really away from everything anyway. Being a bit of a troll. You're okay to boot her off the lineup, but Derek May, who's been accused of a string of flipping heinous, you know, essay assaults or whatnot, allegedly, you're okay to keep on the lineup. <laughs> like what? What kind of? If ever there was a, if ever there was, because I don't, I don't actually agree or subscribe to this idea that dance music or electronic music for the most part is like dominated by toxic masculinity sort of shit. I don't really subscribe to that shit. But if you were gonna try to convince me that the bro tech techno whatever toxic male max masculinity thing was real this would be proof of it the fact that they're willing to boot a woman off for having racy political view opinions right but they're okay to keep a guy on the lineup for legitimately <laughs> assaulting other women lord have mercy anyway it continues I don't blame movement for choosing Craig and I didn't want to make a fuss about it at the time. I didn't want to detract from the celebration of Detroit Techno, all the more special this year due to being the first movement since 2019 due to the pandemic and the first scene the summer of racial reckoning in 2020. To be fair, this is a little bit self-absorbed because I don't necessarily think most people... This is the thing I think is really bizarre and really strange when it comes to dance music. It's inherently political, right? Even though I don't like it and I don't want it to be, it is inherently political. But for whatever reason, it feels like to me the majority of the public don't give a fuck. The majority of the public have no idea that of the politics going on in the scene, like stuff that you might hear. Like let's let's say for instance like the Peggy Goo and the Daniel Wang situation I, I covered ages ago. Do you think most fans of Peggy Goo give a shit about what happened with Daniel Wang? Do you think most Daniel Wang fans give a shit about what happened with Peggy Goo? None of them care. It doesn't affect their decision-making process when they're going to buy a ticket. It doesn't affect their um, love and adoration, admiration for those um, two artists and DJs. It doesn't do anything. It's only for like, 
like deep heads like us or people that give a shit about that sort of stuff that will kind of care most people don't really give a shit so this idea that somehow a review of a festival is going to really negatively affect the success of it overall nah, it's a little bit self-absorbed it's a little bit self-important but it's also intriguing that no one really cares to the level of women will come out and detail in excruciating forensic detail with corroborating witnesses um kind of whatever it may be of their issues and their struggles and their trauma and the episode whatever they went through and no one will really care it doesn't actually do anything like it doesn't do much like again i love jack master he's my guy and everything right but what jack master he went through a situation too and in the, in the end did anyone really care not really do you know what i mean like it, it just you just move on and continue and people just continue going on their careers it's a very strange thing you would imagine a scene that would be rooted in some level of politics would be a little bit more um, sensitive to those kind of allegations and would treat them as seriously as, as they probably should treat them but it doesn't necessarily happen that way who's the other guy too there's another dj too who's out there um is it volk or volk or something like that vox or something i forgot his name who's like a, a legitimate neo-nazi <laughs> and he still plays places he still makes music and shit and it's like ah i don't know man I, I find it odd i don't know what it is about dance music i don't know if because most general public people or most normies just go to raves and festivals to get fucked up maybe that's the point of it maybe most people go like if, if, if there's a if if you say your intentions are like in percentages m maybe 70 percent of your intentions of going out if you love dance music you love electronic music is maybe just to get fucked it's not to actually listen to music it's not to hear somebody dj it's not to see somebody that's like by proxy but you're mostly going to go and get fucked especially nowadays with like in the post-pandemic world and recession looming you want to just ignore your day-to-day -day struggles and kind of just black out and go out and do ghb do care do coke do molly do ecstasy drink loads you hook up with people. I didn't, maybe that's why but i i really don't understand it i really don't get it because those that article on ra with by Derek may was fucking brutal even if you don't believe it you would imagine just the the stories alone would be enough smut to put on someone's name where you just wouldn't want to be next to them. It's too radioactive. But for some reason, you can kind of get away with it. Weirdly enough, it feels like you can kind of just like, you know, you might have, it might be embarrassing that it's happened, but you can like, I think of, um, what's his name? Uh, fucking God bless the dead, but what's his name? Uh, who was accused of some crazy shit. What was his fucking name? That DJ guy that passed away. Mixed race dude. I forgot his name, but it comes to mind him as well. Something tells me that if he wasn't so stricken with guilt or whatever the reason is that he ended up kind of self-expiring, who's to say if he was still around, he could probably ride it out. Even though what he was accused of was flipping crazy, if he wanted to, he could probably ride it out if you look at what's happened to other people. That's the crazy thing about it. Like, there is nothing if I feel like a DJ could do legitimately that could get them quote-unquote cancelled. It doesn't look like it. Like, if Tiesto went out and shot someone in the back of the head tomorrow, right? He'd be fine. Like, he's still going to get booked in places. I legitimately think so. If Carl, if, if, what's, his, what's his name? He's the fucking guy that I hate that's always smiling with his gap tooth open or stuff. What's his name? Oh, whatever. That black guy, right? If he went, if he, he went and run someone over and he's fucking Range Rover Sport, he'd be fine. Carl Cox, right? He'd be completely fine. No one would absolutely bat an eyelid. I don't think so, personally. Um, but yeah, weirdly. Anyway, let's continue. It's kind of like MMA in that way. DJing the UFC you feel that UFC MMA is the same sort of thing people don't really get cancelled what they say you can say some racist shit in the UFC MMA like just the other day this fighter flipping he called um, what do you call Brazilian people rats or something right I don't know he called something derogatory um, he obviously got smoked in his next fight but still he said it and he wasn't cut he wasn't dis disqualified or you know sacked or whatever it was just you know it is what it is um, anyway continue this article article it says but I knew I couldn't let it slide completely Craig banned me from reviewing the movement because of two investigations I wrote for resident advisor in November 2020 and January 2021. Detailing allegations of sexual assault and sexual harassment against his friend and mentor, Detroit te techno um, producer, sorry, techno pioneer, Derek May. Craig banned me because I wrote on Twitter that he was in the bin along with May when the allegation first came out to my attention on September 2020 at the same time that I was investigating another sexual predator, late Eric Murillo. Oh, that's the guy, Eric Murillo. Craig was quick to come to the director's defense at the time and says, I don't turn my back on my brothers. It says techno for life. Now, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand why. Hmm. Let me be fair. Let me be fair. I, 
I am not a fan of cancel culture, which is weird to say this, right? I'm really not a fan of cancel culture in that I'm not a fan of like a gatekeeper or gatekeepers telling people who, like basically saying who can and cannot have a career. I feel like careers, especially in entertainment, especially careers that not, don't involve like a regular nine to five, a career kind of like in the arts or, you know, outside of a, a conventional corporate environment or workplace. I feel like those careers are usually built off the back of someone's hard work and their connection with their fans. So their fans discover them, they like what they do, they tell their friends and then they kind of grow organically together, right? In that regard. So then if you go and then make a social fur par, you go and film some, you know, you go and film someone in a suicide forest, you say nigga, nigga, nigga too much on your live stream, you have some derogatory statements to say about LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community people, uh, you make some racial slur thing, whatever you may say, whatever you may say or do, I don't think those comments should constitute in you losing your career, especially if you built your career off your own back with your fans. Now, if it means sponsors and... Um, production company people and whatever advertisers pulling away from you because you're bad for their business that's one thing but the industry coming together and saying this guy can't get on playlist this guy can't be booked on festivals everywhere festivals are not even connected to each other that's the thing i have a problem with that's the thing that i don't like and i feel like nowadays it feels like counter culture is more so geared towards let's try and take this person's career off of them as opposed to let's let the public know this person's a monster then the public can make a decision themselves and hopefully that person's career will die a slow death because i think that's what should happen i think if fans if fans can make your career fans should also be able to kind of take it away from you oh, i'm gonna go to screen the whole time oh sorry i didn't have a screen the whole time do you know what I mean? yeah i mean fans should be able to take it away from you you know it is the world fans should be able to be like hey we don't like what you did there your career is gone now that's what they should be able to do, I feel like. But nowadays, it feels like the power is too much in the industry's hands. Like they can decide you don't play festivals, you don't play clubs, you don't go on radio, you don't do this. And I feel like that's just too much in that respect. But I also feel like when it comes to certain allegations, even if it's your friend, you owe the victims who have come forward and just in terms of common decency to just keep your mouth shut. There's no need for Carl Craig to come out and say, I don't turn my back on my brothers and techno for life. It's nonsense. This guy wasn't accused of embezzling money. He wasn't accused of stealing equipment. He wasn't accused of flaking on DJ sets. He was accused of sexual assault and harassment, bruv. That's like some pretty crazy allegations. And they were very detailed, very extensive. They went through all that journalistic, whatever thing they have to go through in terms of making sure they're legit and shit, corroborate with people, blah, 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 double check, triple checked and whatnot. So for you to come out and be like, I don't tell them back my brothers because of sexual assault, that is insane. Maybe privately you should still stick with your friends. I, I, like, you know, I, I, I think... We have to be sensible and say, if you have a friend, you know, if you have friends in general, you should probably have an internal moral list or something where you say, okay, there are certain things if my friend does to me that I'm not ever going to forgive. Like if you're a girl, if your friend hooks up with your partner, you might be like, okay, cool. That's a complete deletion. You know I mean, I'm not your friend anymore and it's on site every time I see you. If you're a guy, you might be like, oh, if my friend steals money from me or steals something, a bit of clothing, that's an instant, you know what I mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bang you up and you're not my guy anymore. It's certain things you should have in your list. And if it's one of your lists, it's like, okay, if my friend ever gets accused of something involving S-A, you know, S-H, R-word, whatever it may be, touching kids and shit, you're completely deleted. I mean, you're off and you're done. Go away from me. Unless there's some mitigating consequences or story that he read the wrong signs, he was this, he was, whatever. But usually you should have your list of things. But the fact that you don't have it, it makes you look more sus as well. It makes you even look probably worse than the person who's been accused of it. If you're the one that's going to go out and say, nah, man, that's my boy. And he's been accused of R and SA and SH. You're like, yo, that is next level. Because if anything, what that does to me, similar to what happened to the whole Brian Callan, Chris D'Elia situation when they were crying and Brendan Shaw was for crying when Chris D'Elia went down for being accused of, you know, maybe trying to hook up with too many young girls or girls that are on the cusp of being legal and not legal. Usually when you're crying and you're really emotional about your friend getting taken out of something like that so crazy, it usually means you have your own crazy stuff in your own skeleton. You have your own crazy skeletons in your own closet. Usually, you'd imagine so. Because no normal person would have that sort of reaction because 
it's not you. Do you know what I mean? Like, why were you? Why are you crying and shaking? Like, you didn't do nothing wrong. It's horrible and heinous. You should be in shock. Maybe you should maybe have nothing to say. You should be maybe find it hard to find your words and to articulate what you feel like. But crying and convulsing and <laughs> it means you probably have your own skeletons in your closet too. So the fact that you're typing in all caps, I don't tell my back of my brothers. That makes you look a bit sussy. But also, if you're Annabelle Ross, I would say as much as I like her. I don't think you should be saying someone's in the bin because they decided to back their friend. It's gross, it's disgusting, but they didn't, you have no evidence that they did a thing. Do you know what I mean? It's, let's keep the focus on the guy that actually did it. Um, oh, what did say? And, and I, I guess it's someone. Uh, okay, and, and then he made it. Obviously, so, so it looks like from Carl Craig's point of view, he just doesn't believe the allegations because this tweet says here as follows. It's from 2020, I guess, somewhere around that time. It says, social media is just like being back in grade school where rumours are passed around as truth with no proof. It's incredible how people will freely believe accusations by someone they don't personally know. Ask yourself what these people contribute to our world. So that's a weird statement to make because it feels like people that make those kind of statements, I feel like are just trying to um, convince themselves that what their friend did what their friend's been accused of they didn't do because it obviously looks bad on you too because you're their friend and you didn't know that they were a monster behind closed doors but if you take it on face value what that means is that he's basically saying unless you get proven guilty in a court of law by a jury then you're innocent always which is insane because if you heard a rumor about your friend in the area you know our wording someone would you need to see proof in order to believe it or maybe would you say that guy was always a bit sus anyway and just to veer on the side of caution and because I could get friends anywhere and it's not that serious, I'm going to probably cut him out of my life because I don't want to be associated with somebody who even has that sort of smart on their name unless he's able to really convince me and sit me down and say, hey, Ag, listen, this story is not true. This what happened, blah, blah, blah. But most of the time, do you need proof all the time to convince yourself that someone's a dickhead, that someone might be a piece of shit? Really? Like, come on. Anyway, it continues. I can understand Craig wanted to support May, especially given the impact that he's had on Craig's career, life and trajectory, and in trying to defend Detroit techno legacy they're both integral to, a legacy that has historically been obscured by the rise of over overwhelmingly white electronic music. But Craig, who has been close to May for nearly 40 years, doesn't need to read the articles to know that May has been mistreating women for decades. True. So they're trying to do some sort of some Black Lives Matter, Detroit, uh, you know, techno is black sort of cultural sort of solidarity thing, which is fucking bizarre to try and use. Again, this is Annabelle Ross kind of including her own idea of why she thinks that it's not Craig saying it. But if that is the case, that is fucking nuts. That is legitimately nuts. <laughs> but anyway, it continues. Um, it takes off this course tomorrow. Um, but Craig, who has been close to May for nearly 40 years, doesn't need to read articles. And it's, tis, and it's this bros before hoes mentality, particularly prevalent in electronic music, that makes it so hard to hold abusers such as May accountable for their behavior. Um, it's the brotherhood that makes them stay quiet after witnessing or hearing about the abuse, fearing repercussions in the form of losing bookings or record deals or simply being ostracized from the community. It's the brotherhood that makes it possible for men in the industry to abuse women while continuing to collect fat paychecks. It's the brotherhood that encourages men uh, um, around abusers to turn a blind eye to bad behavior, especially when they're also making profits. Boom! Annabelle Ross coming with the fucking blows. No, I believe that. I definitely do believe that, especially if this is occurring on this side of the thing right where these guys i wouldn't say they're the most like commercially famous people they're obviously legacy acts in terms of well known but in terms of being at the top of the kind of uh, you know relevancy circuit and all the instagram pages and shit these aren't the most famous teachers in the world so if they're willing to do this with themselves right and police each other this way and kind of turn a blind eye and not say anything just imagine what's going on with the tech house people with the edm people who are up at the top who are the dance with the techno uh, techno people with the hardcore people wherever it may be just imagine what's going on over there just imagine what's going on over there day to day it must be fucking insane um anyway it continues in Detroit, belonging to a brotherhood also means preserving the mythical status of Detroit techno, and there are a few figures more central to that myth than Derek May. This part weekend, toxic male solidarity really is head again when another Detroit hero, Omar S. Oh, no! I love Omar S. Oh, come on, man! Come on! Don't tell me Omar S. is a freak as well. Come on! Okay, let's continue. Omar S tagged me in a post shared on Instagram page on Saturday afternoon. Although I had been banned from reviewing, I still went to Detroit and went to Movement, along with some other parties held over the weekend. Ooh, Annabelle putting herself in the flipping eye of the fire on the belly of the beast. It continues. I had seen Smith, one of my favorite producers, play. Oh, at Marble Bar on Memorial Day. 
When we ran into him in the smoke area, we took a group photo, fangirling shamelessly. Smith didn't know who I was at the time, but after seeing my photo on Instagram, Derek May gave him a heads up. Oh no! In response, Smith had taken a screenshot of my group photo and passed an image of May over my friend's face next to my own. Derek May was written across the top of the photo. The caption read, these ladies support Derek May, guys. Oh my God. <laughs> May commented on the post with three crying laugh laughter emojis and shared the post in his stories. Smith post gathered hundreds of likes. By the time I woke up on Sunday morning, the post was gone. Yeah, that's the thing with Derek, with Omar S. He's one of those, he's one of those um, guys who loves to post and delete. Guys who post and delete are always sussy anyway, man. If you're going to be spicy and you're going to do like girly, bitchy shit like this where you crop pictures and you're putting things like, like just pure, neat, lame, nerd behavior, stand on it and leave it up on your page. Why are you deleting it for? Why are you taking it down for? Do you know what I mean? If you really want to be fuck resident advisor guy, then, you know what I mean? Like, go all the way to it. But the fact they delete it is a bit sussy, but this is so, so bad. Oh, mate, these guys are fucking insane. So, fuck Resident Advisor for what? Like, why doesn't Omar Israel like Resident Advisor? Like, honestly, some of these, the, 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 the dance music logic is fucking insane. I can't get out of my head that Nina Kravitz is easier to kick off a lineup for having racy, controversial, edgelord, 4chan type fucking political opinions, right? Again, it's gross what she's into. She likes Putin. She's supporting the invasion of Ukraine, probably. But she's also not picking up a fucking AK-47. Do you know what I mean? She's doing it from the lap of luxury of her apartment, in her silk grove, in her amazing apartment, listening to good music and with a great label and a great life. She's not really got any skin in the game. That's easier to kick off a lineup than somebody who legitimately has been accused of assaulting and abusing people. Like, God almighty. And then you've got his friends who are also got these really interesting and somewhat eye-opening and refreshing opinions on dance music and the industry and the media around it in terms of fuck resident advisor thing that Omar um, is on. But then they're also comfortable with backing their guy who's been accused of SAN and, and SH for fucking women. It's fucking nuts. And then they take the piss out of one of the journalists that read the article. It's just like, oh my God, bro. Like, this isn't even trolling. This is just like, what? what is it? Is this like enabling? Is this excusing? Um, what is this behavior? Like, what? what is this? What is this? And it, like, it's interesting. Like, how, how can you, how can you stand there and complain about techno being whitewashed? Complain about the commercialization of the music? Complain about gentrification? Complain about the politics, complain about the gatekeepers, all this sort of stuff concerning techno. But then when it comes to policing your own friends for heinous crimes, you want to turn a blind eye under the guise of like, because it wouldn't be surprised me if some of these guys have, have the opinion of like, oh, why are we cancelling Derek if there's XYZ white guy DJs who also do this shit, have a career, no one cancels them. It's like, huh? So what now? Are we, are we now saying that unless you're, <laughs> unless you abuse somebody and you're white, then, like, if you be someone but you're black, you have to be protected because you don't get representation in this industry. It's like, like, it, it hurts your brain even to fucking work that out and try to make it make sense in your head. I understand in some way, if you look at it and say, hey, if Guy Gerber still got a career, why does my career have to get cancelled? I understand in that respect, fair enough. But, like I said beforehand, I'm not a fan of cancel culture in terms of the industry cancelling you. I'm a fan of your fans saying, you're a fucking piece of shit, we're not going to support you anymore. Cool. So maybe, unfortunately, if Guy Gerber is so famous that he's, most of his very his fans don't actually know about whatever allegations he's been accused of, and he still has a career, that's sad and unfortunate, but it's the nature of the beast because he's just too famous. I mean, he's, he's at a level where, like, the fans just don't give a fuck. Like, who's that, who's that, who's that country music star recently who was, um, you know, fucked off his head, was dropped back, you know, was, take, was on the way back to his friend's house or whatever, or his house, and I guess he started just like calling his friends niggas and shit and N-bombs and with hard R's and shit, right? And it was a pretty heinous video to see. But, you know, he's clearly fucked and, you know, maybe it wasn't cancelled worthy, but it didn't really do anything to his career. If anything, it propelled his music. Do you know what I mean? His streams went up in a crazy way because most of his fans don't care that he calls his white friends niggas because they don't care. So what are you going to do? Are you going to then start saying because a black person says something similar that they, I, I don't know, I just can't, I just can't. My brain hurts trying to figure it out because it doesn't make any sense. And these are all adults with children, by the way. These are all grown-ups. Like, they're far older than me. Like, these guys are in their 50s and shit. And they're like... I don't know. 
I don't know. Later on Sunday afternoon, a friend alerted me on a new post. Craig had shared a same group photo from Marble Bar with Mace Face superimposed over my friends. Says, I support niggas, I support niggas from Detroit. Jan read the caption. Again, it attracted a few hundred likes and shared by Smith and May in Instagram stories when I woke up Monday. The post to see, Derek, bruv, Carl Craig, all these guys, uh, they're just pussies, bruv. Like, leave the thing up. Leave the thing up. If you're going to be edgelord and support your friend for fucking SA and SH, which is fucking nuts, nuts. In my head, in my head, I've always said I'd probably I'd probably excuse my friend from murder over flipping sexual assault. Number one, because sexual assault thing is just like you know what I mean, like I can't be your friend anymore. But the murder stuff, like legitimately, there might be a there might be a there might be a reason. You might have you might have duppied your fucking school bully. You might have to defend your family or some shit. You know what I mean, there could be context to it. But SA, like Giza, like ah, oh, like really, 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 this is what we're doing. We're defending our friend, or or do we generally believe that this is not true? In some weird, like, you know those kind of, like, um, preachers in Christian churches and shit, when they get accused of diddling kids, and the congregation's like, nah, it can't be him, he's a godly man, he's a saint, he's an angel. It's like, maybe that's got what they've got. They've got this, like, techno-delirium, um, Detroit techno-delirium syndrome, where they're like, it cannot be true. He's part of the crew. Oh, it's like, fuck off. Anyway, it continues. The message they were trying to send between me was clear. However, don't fuck with Detroit. Uh, however, yeah, don't fucking trip. I think they were probably pretty riled up. I had the um, necessity to visit the city after publishing something unflattering about one of the giants of Detroit Techno and to post a photo of Omar S. I don't think it was by chance either that their post coincided with the world premiere of Detroit Techno documentary so God said, give them drum and machines at Tribeca Festival, which I attended on Saturday night. Nah, again, I, I, would, I, I don't think... Do you reckon... But yeah, who knows, man? If you're willing to cut and copy and paste in people's pictures over yours and make snarky posts, maybe you are capable of doing that shit as well. Continues. Last one I posted about the film on Twitter, having heard of allegations against May, would not be addressed in the documentary. Also, <laughs> after reaching out to the filmmaker, someone responded to my email telling me that the allegations would, would be acknowledged and they were very brief at the end of the film, concluding with a statement that said denies any wrongdoing. That's true, of course, but to me, the statement... Okay, this is what I don't like. I get Annabelle Ross did a great um, article in terms of addressing the allegations against him and whatnot, but I don't like this idea of like following him around media wise and getting people to maybe take down the thing, delete him from it. You know what I mean, because yes, he got accused of what he's getting accused of and he's most likely a creep. But if there's a documentary coming out focusing on just the music, I don't know, like let them tell that story. You know what I mean, you, like it's like I always think like whenever people pass away who are very controversial divided opinion who have that a very checkered past for instance if, if god forbid mike tyson passed away tomorrow i don't think every documentary should include why he went to prison if they want to have a documentary that just focuses on his growing up in new york before you know under the age of 18 do that if you want to focus on him when he was just finishing his career do that if you want to focus on him when to when he got that face tattoo do that but it shouldn't always have to include the bad controversial bits all the time i feel that's a bit ott i think sometimes documentaries that do that it gets a bit annoying do you know what i mean like we know we know do you know what i mean like it's like as crazy as it sounds like if somebody was to make a documentary about r kelly's influence on music should all of these documentaries have to focus on the sorry on the crime that he committed in terms of abusing all those young girls no because he's you know he put he, like for a brief brief period of his time he was a musical genius and of course he did all those fucking heinous acts yes they're gonna define him but in terms of telling a story from a filmmaker's point of view they should be able to tell it's like it's like if you're painting something you shouldn't have to if you're gonna paint a landscape it doesn't mean you have to paint the entire landscape you can just paint a particular um frame that you want to kind of highlight and kind of blow up and make it big so it kind of takes up the whole space. Do you understand know kind of something? It's a bit crazy to say that, but I do think that's the case. And I think following people around doing stuff, it makes it, it's a bit weird in that regard. That's the only thing I don't like personally. Um, but again, maybe when it comes to this article, maybe it touched the writers so much that they legitimately have like a personal, um, they kind of feel like it's a personal mission to kind of see it through. And that's where sometimes it kind of can get blurred when you're a journalist, do you know what I mean? Because it's something maybe you might have suffered from in the past or whatever, do you know what I mean? Like I, I can understand the vigor behind it, but I do get the filmmakers maybe insistence of kind of being like, hey, we're not involved in that. We're just trying to tell a story about Detroit Techno. Blah, 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 blah. It continues. Um, da, 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 da. That's true of me, of course. That's true, of course. But to me, this statement was weighed towards uh, defending May and the previous 90 plus minutes of the documentary in which May plays a, st a starring role and is cast as Techno plus a film comedian. 
<laughs> yeah, that must be disgusting. Imagine if you're a victim of, of what he's been accused of and you got him on a fucking documentary giggling and smiling about high hats and bass lines and shit. Like, what? <laughs> fucking hell, honestly. Like, people, it's just, it really does surprise me how little people care. Especially when you think of, like, the society, the societal side of things and the social justice side of things and it comes with dance music, electronic music. Like, people don't give a fuck. They really don't. Like, you can get accused of whatever and people really don't care. The woman May is alleged to have abused along the way. I uh, felt like um, an afterthought, a, mem a momentary disclaimer buried underneath reams of li uh, lionizing footage. And before the innocent proven until guilty brigade comes at me, consider just a free. Yeah, that, those type of people are the worst, personally for me. The ones who are fans of people and say innocent until proven guilty are the worst. I'd much rather you just say, if you're a Derek May fan, I'd much rather you just say, look, I'm a fan of his music. I don't let the, what you call it? I don't, I don't, what's up, what's up, people, afraid people say? I don't, um, I don't like to mix the art and the artist. I just focus on the art. That's what I'm a fan of. Everything he does outside of it, I don't care. Then you saying, oh, bro, it is until proven guilty. Who says the allegations are true? What evidence is there? They're all anonymous. Like, that is, that, that drives me insane. Because it's like, what, you need, does, do, do all allegations need to be run through the court of law before you, are, like, you, you might think there might be some credence to it? Unless it's proven guilty in a, in, a, in a court of law by a unanimous jury, you're never going to flip and believe it. Are you for real? Like, come on, man. How many sussy stories have we heard of people in ends from hoods that you've grown up in? I've had many freaky, dodgy people that you've heard. Oh, yeah, this guy touches up kids. Oh, yeah, this guy did this. guy did this. You don't wait for them to go to prison. You either fucking hear the story and keep it away from them. Or when you see them again, you just rush them and beat them up. Do you know what I mean? You don't wait for someone to tell you, oh, they're guilty. Now you're going to do it. It's like, fuck off, man. You've been accused of that shit. You've got a smut on your name. It's up to you to prove yourself innocent as opposed to me to kind of believe you off the bat. Like, why do I owe you that benefit of the doubt? <clears throat> Especially with fans too. You don't, you don't know these people. That's a, maybe a parasocial relationship as well. Innocent to proven guilty. Maybe to your friends and your family, but to a random DJ who would never give you guest list. <laughs> I mean, a DJ that's not, that's not kind, like not a kind person. You're, you're doing this to It's like, what? Anyway, it continues. Um, Consider just 310 of every 100,000 sexual assaults are reported to the police. 50 of those reports will lead to an arrest and 28 cases will lead to a felony conviction. That's just a 2.8% um, sexual assaults that will lead to a criminal charge. The criminal justice system has always been stacked against survivors when it comes to prosecuting sexual assault. Of course, of course. So this idea that somehow because just because it happened to you and you go to the police that person is going to be found guilty is nuts and insane. Um, especially when you consider the, the fucking dehumanizing you know, situations and they have to go through as women when you kind of have to kind of, you know, give evidence and rape kits and shit. And if you wash before, you might destroy the evidence. Like, all these sort of weird shit happens that really kind of hinders the possibility of convicting somebody. Someone to say, oh yeah, man, it's until proven guilty, bro. Like, come on. There are many more allegations against Derek May than those you read out um, in these two articles and more serious ones. I couldn't write about all of them and all the foul tactics employed by May and his team to try and undermine me and the survivors, but I fought the nine direct accounts of assault or harassment or the more sexually appropriate behavior across two and fact checks and legally will be people considering their events of May. That's why I don't like. It sounds a bit like she went into it hoping to cancel his career, which I don't think you should have that in your mind. You should have it in your mind. I'm going to expose and maybe highlight or shine a light on this dark side of this person's personality that no one actually sees. And then you can make your decision up as fans and as industry people. But this idea that I'm going to go on a personal crusade to end the person's career, I'm not really down for personally, in my opinion. I feel like if the fans don't give a fuck, like legitimately, look, if you're able to make articles together and corroborate these witnesses and put together these accounts and fans don't care and industry doesn't care, you can't, there's nothing much more you can do. Really isn't. Like, what more can you do? If people still keep booking him, if he keeps getting featured in documentaries and his friends keep defending him online, there's nothing else that you can do personally, unfortunately. It's horrible and it's disgusting, but that's just the way of the beast. Like, did you, don't, don't you guys remember all those crazy aunties outside of fucking R. Kelly's court um, case when he was getting convicted? My man was feeling guilty of multiple sexual assaults and it was known for ages anyway that he was a bit of a creep. Yet they were still defending him outside. Not to believe in the victims, saying he did nothing wrong, saying the victims are whores, like, you know, what's, what's that thing called they say? Um, slut shaming, all that sort of stuff. It happens all the time. And unfortunately, if R. Kelly was out right now and he went on tour, he'd sell that bitch out. Or at least he'd sell tickets. 
maybe not sell it all out, but he would, people would go to see him play for sure, for 100% sure. He might get some collaborations along the way for sure. I believe it, sure. So it's an unfortunate side of society, but I just don't like the personal vendettas and crusade people have in terms of cancer people. I think it's a bit gross, personally, for me. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't want one person to be like the judge and jury for my career. I'd much rather, okay, cool. I did something heinous, did something bad, and then my fans decide we don't want to fuck with you. The sponsors run away. The advertisers run away. That's fair enough. But the industry saying, hey, we're going to delete your record label contract because you did this thing. Unless it's, again, unless it's fucking murder and shit like i don't know man like it's a bit weird i don't know it's a bit it's a bit weird it's a bit weird because i'd imagine if you're a dj do you have do you even have a contract do you have a clause in your contract that says if you do something like you know like normal employment contract it says if you do something um, what's that term called again what's that term when you're contract when you're employed if you do something um if you do something really bad like i don't know you don't turn up for work you still equipment. I mean, they have a, they have means to basically terminate your contract on on the spot. I don't think DJs have that, do they? Because what contract do you sign? Maybe with your agency, maybe with your manager, your managing management team. It's very difficult, I'd imagine, to like actually cancel someone's career as a DJ. Anyway, really, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be? I don't know. Because you got someone like a six nine is a good example. He's kind of cancelled in hip hop, right? But if he decided to just focus on reggaeton and just dominate the latin c countries or communities he'd be fine if he decided to come to europe and just start making music here he'd be fine too i don't people would actually care about the snitching thing in the u.s i don't think so do you know what i mean and it's a completely different industry it might be the same labels but it's a different industry and business in europe and in latin america than it is in north america you'd imagine but it continues let me end this before I keep rambling. I can understand why fans would want to believe that May is innocent or to downplay the allegations. Ignorance literally is bliss when it comes to our musical heroes and being able to dance freely to tracks that have brought us such joy. But I can tell you that the women who claim to have been abused by May can't hear strings of life without being reminded of their trauma. Yeesh. I can't enjoy his music either anymore and Carl Craig lost me as a fan after our Twitter spat nearly two years ago. Just a fortnight after I visited the party after party, sound installation in Dia, being in, in Dia Beacon Museum upstate New York. After the months of nightlife being shuttered down to the pandemic party after party um, which recreated the sound atmosphere of the techno bunker with visceral intensity in a museum basement made me cry tears of joy fast forward a couple of weeks and this man who I had admired as an artist for years was suddenly an enemy and my visit to Dia, to Dia, to Dia Beacon sorry, um, what had easily been my favourite experience of 2020 was a tarnished memory I'm generally gutted that Omar S's music is now technically for me too yeah fuck you know she's losing everyone isn't it it's not surprising that Carl Craig um that Craig Smith, that, that Craig and Smith would want to support May, a child and black musician whose success paved the way for their own, but to do it publicly and mocking the slap in the face of the survivors of abuse everywhere. It's a damning display of toxic male solidarity in a scene where women, trans and non-binary people are used to, are used to coming last. Which is, that's the thing, if you don't believe that bro culture exists, then this, this whole affair is definitely illuminating, isn't it? Because... But again, maybe on their side of things, they generally don't think he did anything wrong. That might be this. That might be honestly what it is. They generally might think the story and allegation against him are not true, and it's all just lies. Um, it continues. Four days into Detroit, I was barely enough to scratch the surface of the city, but it's more than enough people to observe the resilience, whose endurance. Uh, continue, continue. Techno's black pioneers have long fought for recognition, worth protecting, but so are women. So who have been um, overlooked, unappreciated, and or abused since dance music inception. Childish toxic displays of male solidarity, like the post shared by Carl Craig and Omar S over the weekend, and Craig banning me from writing about the festival reinforced the idea that women's role is to percept the position of sub subjugation and to stay quiet about anything that might threaten my dominance at whatever, whatever cost. I said it before, a sincere apology to May would have gone a long way, a long, long way, coupled with genuine contr contrition and commitment to seek therapy for his behaviour. But we've seen nothing of the sort, just denial, offensive attempts at by May to cast allegations as racism and defying campaign to try to resurrect his tanking career. It's possible to celebrate Detroit techno at the same time to demand accountability at the, from the figures in the scene who have abused their power. Without it, their legacy is threatened, but, that not, but that's not my fault, not the fault of the women who bravely chose to share their stories. The only people they can blame for this is themselves. Scathing report here from um, Annabelle Ross. Actually, let me see. Has he actually played anywhere, Derek? I don't, I don't even know. Let's see. Um, Derek May resident advisor yeah let's see if he's actually had any sets anywhere recently 
So it's because you said his career is tanking. I don't know. Is it, is it tanking? Has he played since those allegations? I'm assuming he probably has, isn't it? But as well, with these production credits anyway, he probably makes a lot of bank off of these old tunes, so it won't really matter, innit? Let's see, past events. What has he actually DJed uh, recently? Oh yeah, he played in June. So that museum gala thing. He played in April. Oh, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been tough, in it? According to what we see here, because I'd assume maybe sometimes he might be a secret guest on some liners, but according to what we see on RA, he's played one, he's played twice this year only, in June and April. April and Upstart Blockbuster in Munich, he played alongside Dren Akims, Derek May, Kevin Saunderson. So yeah, loads of Detroit people there. Fucking hell, man. It's absolutely been crickets for my man, isn't it? absolute crickets but yeah um i do recommend you check out the article really really good article from annabelle ross again one of um my favorite writers in this dance music scene collectively overall i feel like she definitely is somebody who legitimately comes at it from a fa as a fan who happens to be a journalist as opposed to just a journalist you know looking to you know um looking for a bit of fame looking to catch some notoriety i think that that's what kind of separates her writing from most people out there and i definitely recommend you check it out it's available on medium it's called on derek may techno detroit techno and toxic Mas toxic solidarity sorry i'll put the link of the article in the description of the show so you can check it out if you are that way in Klein. but yeah um i think i think that might be it for now because i've already gone by mad mad times and shit oops the camera moved for some reason great 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 um it's been an hour 20 minutes so thank you again for tuning into the show it's been a pleasure to have your company i'm gonna pause it now because i need to go to the gym and work out and shit so thank you for tuning in i'm gonna come back again for another episode of the show later on in the evening so if you're gonna get two podcast day today i don't care i'm putting out the content because i want to and i'll see you guys again on the other side very soon peace take care bye